Hi, I'm Jay Thomas, and welcome to Bald Tires, a proud member of the Saskatchewan Podcast Network. Today, my guest is a guy I've wanted to get on the show since day one that I created Bald Tires. Every time I meet up with him, he's always got another great story, and he shared just a couple of them today. If you're in the car community in Saskatchewan, especially in Saskatoon, you're going to know him probably in person. Kelvin Jansen is joining me today. Him and Rochelle, his wife, are the organizers of the Shifters Car Club, and they do so much for the car community around Saskatoon. Kelvin calls himself the old car doctor. That's his business. He goes around fixing old cars for people, especially when it comes to drivability issues and electronic issues. But today we're going to talk about, well, how he got to be a car guy. There's some funny, fantastic stories along the way. Next episode as well, stick around because Kelvin's going to come back and tell us about all the cool cars he's owned. There's a lot of them. Thanks for listening to Bald Tires, because when you make great memories, you make bald tires. The Saskatchewan Podcast Network is supported by Conexus. Wellness, however you define it, is achievable. You don't even need to figure it out all yourself. Talk to Conexus. They'll give you guidance, motivation, and the push you need to reach your goals. They've got you. They're your financial partner, and they know you can achieve your very best, your financial best. Prove them right. Start right now at Conexus Credit Union. The Saskatchewan Podcast Network is also supported by Direct West. Is marketing getting in the way of running your business? Direct West has a local expert team right here in Saskatchewan that will work with you to build your website exactly how you imagine it. Let them help you improve your online presence. And head to directwest.com now to learn more. Well, we're sitting on the back deck of a friend of mine's place, and uh, I think he's got a story or two to tell us. <laughs> Kelvin Jansen's joining me right now. Kelvin, thanks for coming on the podcast today. Hey, no problem. Okay. I, I got a thousand questions for you, I'm sure. And every time we get together at the, a Shifters Car Show, there's always uh, lots to talk about. And, and you've got a story about every car drives by. I love it. I absolutely love it. And I mean, how many how many are we going to get up tonight? We'll, we'll see. But let's start with this question. You're a, you're a huge car guy, and you do it as, as, a, as a gig now. I mean, you've, you've done it for your whole life, but you're now self, self-made self man. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They call you the old car doctor. Yeah. Well, I've been working on the Freedom 98 plan for many, many, many years, and I've got a, quite a number of them to go yet. And uh, I always heard these words of wisdom that if you enjoy what you do, you never work a day in your life. Mm-hmm. So after spending, wasting, no, gaining experience. Okay. For many, many years in the workforce, um, I decided with a little coaching from Rochelle, obviously. Yeah. That maybe I should just do what I do, what I love to do. Mm-hmm. And uh, one of the most wonderful things about it is that the people in the car community are, to a huge extent, excellent excellent people yeah and so even though i'm taking money out of their pocket so to speak um they all become friends yeah you know um when i work on stuff for people it's uh kind of a problem solving kind of an idea (laughs) um and i i have a a reasonably high standard i believe um and i won't I won't do a repair any lesser than I would do for myself. Yeah. And so far, that's served relatively well. Now, now you focus mainly on electronics. That's your specialty, right? Electrical, yeah, primarily, yeah. Um, Well, that's kind of where it started. Uh, See, being that I do it mobile, Mm -hmm. uh, I don't have a shop, and the city would frown on me doing it at my house... Um, most people's shops aren't really set up for much more than, uh, the kind of stuff that I can do easily mobile. Right. Um, I can't bring along a vehicle lift. I can't bring along air impact tools or I can, I mean, yeah, you can get battery and electric and stuff like that, but, but getting into heavy mechanical work and stuff like that just isn't really feasible as a mobile thing. Meg, mega suspension components. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if there's a specific problem with a car when the majority of the mechanical is done, like I've, I've had to deal with a few where uh, they've done, you know, say a rack and pinion steering conversion, and they can't get through figuring out how to uh, hook the steering column mm-hmm. up to the rack. 
and have it work. So a number of complicated U-joint angles and these sorts of things. And so stuff like that I'll solve as an exception, mostly. Yep. Um, but primarily I do um, electrical, which has kind of turned into my carburetor is a problem, and I so I do that sort of thing. Um, I've heard a lot of guys say, oh, I got Calvin to rebuild my carburetor. Now it runs perfect, but more than one now. So it's almost becoming a specialty of yours, hey? Well, it has sort of, yeah. Um, there's, nobody, there's nobody around to do it. Well, nobody you got wants no, to. You've got no competition because nobody <laughs> wants to. Well, it's funny because it's not that, I don't know, maybe I'm, maybe I'm oversimplifying it. But, um, you know, I look at it this way. New vehicles, uh -huh. um, even the new muscle cars and these sorts of, you know, all of the, what I call BGVs, boring grown-up vehicles, <laughs> yeah. um, they're all over. But they are unnecessarily overcomplicated. Mm -hmm. um, they've taken the, the driving away from the driver. Um, oh, yeah. Stuff like uh, lane keep warnings and and automatic emergency braking and and automatic headlamps and and people don't even realize that their tail lights aren't on because they've been deprogrammed to the point where they don't even know you have to turn a switch on yep. you know and i think about the simplicity of all of the older vehicles and and how to this day um if you want reliability if you want durability if you want something that will still work 30 years from now mm -hmm. you might go as complicated as a electronic ignition conversion system but there's really nothing wrong with points condensers yeah. carburetors these newfangled fuel injection systems and i say that it's kind of funny because <laughs> they've been around for 35 years now yeah, yeah in the oem i mean i remember the first fuel injected vehicles i was working at jubilee ford and i thought interesting but who's going to work on that 50 years from now uh-huh yeah and that's how i felt about it then and i i mean i drive a fuel injected bgv and it gets my tools and myself to where it is that i do what i do yeah but um you know that stuff, that, that simple basic stuff, carburetors, ignition systems, that stuff worked perfectly fine mm -hmm. for a hundred years. Yeah. And then they had to go and change it all. And then they changed it. And, and people want this, what they think is simple. They, they can get in and turn the key and fire it up. And so there are a number of companies that make like the fuel injection conversions and stuff and like throttle body bolt on stuff. Yep. And yeah. Personally, I'm not sold. No. I can make a vehicle run just as well and just as reliably with a carburetor mm -hmm. and, and a simple ignition system. Um, I am, however, somewhat biased more towards the, the kind of the stock thing, yeah. you know. Um, I went down the crazy high performance road years and years ago and found them to be extremely high maintenance and <laughs> kind of pointless. <laughs> Um, well, I think it's still more fun to drive a slow car fast than it is to drive a fast car slow. Well, yeah, because it can be rather stressful driving a fast car slow. <laughs> People talk about what they need, what they, what they think they need yeah, yeah. for power. And, uh, and I always tell them the same thing. It doesn't take a great deal of horsepower to break the speed limit. You can do... 60 mile an hour down the highway with roughly 80 ish horsepower mm -hmm. um your classic car your your pride and joy that you're driving that you'd like to enjoy driving and you'd like to be able to afford to drive um building it to make power makes it unreliable and uneconomical <laughs> yep <laughs> so you might like to smoke your tires and you know, get a little out of hand every now and again. And it's not like I'm completely uh, innocent in that respect. <laughs> but um, really, honestly, uh, if it takes less than 80 horsepower to break the law and speed, even on the highway. Yeah. Then you look at the number of miles that we put on our toys throughout the summer. Let's say, 
you know, a few hundred miles. Some people maybe a thousand, thousand. miles. Yeah. yeah. Um, that's if you're going to a lot of outlying shows and stuff. Now you think about the percentage of that time behind the wheel that you spend with your foot on the floor. <laughs> you know, now if you're holding your foot on the floor in a powerful car for more than three seconds, you're endangering yourself and other people. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. So how much power do you need? You can smoke your tires with uh, 200 rear wheel horsepower. Well, sure. Uh, what does that take? Less than 250 flywheel horsepower. Yep. So, you know, I mean, that's just my thoughts on it. <laughs> I like an engine that runs nice. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, back to the, the the headlight thing. You used to know when your headlights weren't on because nothing in your dashboard was lit up. Absolutely. Right? So when you were sitting in your car driving around and it was dark. You couldn't and you read. you couldn't see a damn engages. thing. Right. Yeah. Nothing. Yeah. Couldn't see anything. But they, they screwed this all up when they let the interior dashboard lights come on to make it more illuminated and prettier and all that stuff. Mm. Now it's lit up all the time. And it, people drive around, oh, they and, can see the speedometer. And daytime running lamps. Mm-hmm. So your daytime running lamps come on. You can see the road ahead of you. But a prime example, a, a story, uh, actually, this, this just happened this past, like, late winter. Mm-hmm. I was on my way to get Rochelle some breakfast in the morning, and I usually go to the Tim Hortons. And uh, a fellow pulled out in front of me in an SUV, like, obviously an error in judgment. I don't think he intended to be ignorant or difficult, but he came flying out of a condo apartment uh, <laughs> or parking lot, and I had to brake pretty hard not to hit him. And then he just carried on with no taillights. And uh, it just so happened he pulled into the Tim Hortons right in front of me. <laughs> so he pulled up into the storefront, and... The drive through lineup was long, so I thought, I've got a few minutes to spare. I wasn't going to read him the riot act. I wasn't going to get angry with him. But I thought, you know, I should have a discussion with him. And if I approach it right, it won't be too threatening. So as he was getting out of his car, I pulled up across the back of his vehicle. And I rolled down my passenger window. And I said, excuse me, sir, were you aware that your taillights don't work? And he said, what? I said, well, yeah, uh, start your car up and come have a look. So he started his car and came around back and, well, my headlights are working. I mm -hmm. said, no, I believe that's your daytime running lamps. And he says, well, you mean they're not on when I'm driving? I said, not unless you turn them on with the switch. Do you know where your headlight switch is? He goes, yeah. So he went and flipped the switch on uh -huh. and came back and looked around at the back of the car and... And he says, I had no idea. Mm -hmm. And I said, so how long have you owned this car? Three years. <laughs> Three years. Oh, boy. So uh, I've heard oh. that, I've heard that uh, new car manufacturers have been mandated to make it. Um, if the dash lights up, mm -hmm. the lights have to be fully automatic. Yes. That's, that's so what I've learned, That's too. supposed to be coming out. I don't know. I if think it's it was already now. 21 or 22. Like yeah. new cars arriving now Which will have good. fully automatic headlamp systems that are not. You can't shut it off. Yeah, and that that's fine. I mean, whatever. It it just it's shallowing the gene pool even further. <laughs> um, yeah. Because if you don't actually even have to consciously turn on your lamps, um, how would those people deal with? A high driver input car like any of mine that have no power steering, no power brakes, manual transmissions, it would be like not even worth driving around the block for them. They'd be just so inconvenienced. Well, they say you know? that the manual transmission is the the modern uh, anti-theft yes. system. I got one step up on that too. I put a four-speed shift knob on my three-speed standard. <laughs> so it would really mess them up. And where's reverse? Well... <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay, I want to ask you this. Yep. What what got you into cars in the first place? Were you a car kid? Yeah. Um so my dad my dad incidentally was an amazing amazing mechanic. He was the guy that 
everybody went to. He was the guy that everybody called for advice, um, asked his opinion when they were looking to buy something, called him when they were broken down on the side of the road. Um, he, uh, he worked for a number of garages and then eventually uh, around in 1970, 71, I guess, we moved back to Saskatoon. We'd, we'd lived out in Calgary for, for 69, 70, 71. Okay. And uh, he got a job at SMP. Oh, yeah. He worked there doing electrical and drivability and air conditioning. Now, electrical and drivability, those are the things that I generally specialize in. <laughs> but I didn't learn it from my dad. No? No. He and I didn't work well together. <laughs> okay. Um, because I had to learn everything the hard way. Yeah, I'm one of those kids too. I had no problems making mistakes or, or admitting or uh, uh, dealing with the uh, aftermath or consequences. I realized that that was... But I, I had to learn my way, and uh, and he was more of a do as I say kind of a guy. Mm-hmm, yeah. Um, I'm trying to make life easier for you, which I'm sure actually was his intent, <laughs> but it didn't make learning easier for me. Yeah. Okay. So, but uh, so I was exposed to that sort of stuff. I I mean I remember as a kid in 1971, um, Merv Mann who. Maybe some of your listeners will remember um, he was uh, the son of the owner of Saskatoon Motor Products. Right. And um, he had a lot of super cool cars. And uh, Merv would bring his cars over for Dad to work on on the driveway. Okay. Because he didn't want them going in the shop because he wasn't sure who was going to be working on them. So he wanted only my dad to work on them. So as a, as a you know, we're talking 1971, um, like, you know, I would have been going into grade three that fall. Mm-hmm. And uh, I I was a big kid already. I mean, grade four, I was, in grade five, I was five foot ten. Right? Holy cow. But uh, so I'm crowded, crunched up in the back behind the seats of a genuine 1970 LT1 Corvette. Cool. To go for a ride with Merv Mann and my dad. He would bring his uh, his Camaro pace car uh, over for a little tweaking and stuff. And, <laughs> you know, but it kind of happened even earlier than that. Um, in 1969, uh, well, it, I guess it would have been earlier than that, even 67, 68. My, my, to be uncle okay would come to visit his sweetheart who was my aunt when she was babysitting us and he had a 1966 Fairlane GTA convertible cool uh he sold that and he bought a 1969 Ford Ranger short box fleet side hmm uh black oh Craigers on it and it used to sit out in front of the house when Aunt Sheila would come to to babysit us and, <laughs> and uh i mean that that was you know i mean i was i was young uh and he had a 1969 el camino ss 396 oh, four some, speed car some pretty hot stuff yeah um my other uncle my uncle stan well i have many but uncle stan had a, a galaxy convertible um uh, my uncle john had older cars restored model a's buicks um neat like in the in the 30s like 20s and 30s cars um he was big time into studebakers and you know dad i mean dad dad had lots of cars not by my standard but he had lots of cars um he was always dragging something home from a an oddball english ford to a, a 56 meteor to a uh some strange console or a, a 55 cadillac convertible hmm. or uh you know, always fixer uppers, front knacks and falcon wagons and you name it. So we were kind of exposed to that sort of stuff, but I think it really hit home in in nineteen sixty nine. The summer of sixty nine. Mm-hmm. Um I was finishing grade one in Calgary and I would walk down 
the main drag in Calgary. I think it was um, third. I don't remember what the main was. We lived on uh, Third Street, I think it was. Anyways, and uh, I walked right past a GM dealership every day on the way home from school. Okay. And all of the muscle cars were sitting there, the Camaros and the Chevelles and the Novas and the Corvettes, and the and they were sitting there in the showroom and on the lot out front. And, and oh, wow, that was just amazing, you know? So one day on my way home from school, walking down the back alley, and I stumbled onto something sitting in the back alley. I didn't know what it was. Hmm. It had been run over. It was crushed, <laughs> but it sure looked cool. And it had all kinds of nifty parts. So I dragged it home and I put it on the coffee or the picnic table in the backyard. And, and I started straightening bent pieces, and monkeying with this and checking with that. And I didn't know what it was, but I figured in order for it to do what it seems to want to do, this has to be out of the way of this. It's clearly bent. And I straightened everything out and, and then it seemed to do what it was supposed to do, whatever that was. And uh, when my dad got home from work, he said, what junk did you drag home today? <laughs> and I said, I don't know what it is, but it's pretty cool. And he looked at it and he said, oh, I know what that is. I said, what? He says, that's a highway hi-fi. Oh, cool. Yeah. So uh, I had no idea, but he hooked it up to the battery in our van and hooked a speaker to it and it worked really so he built a wooden box for it and put it on the tv and put a automotive battery and a trickle charger behind the tv and <laughs> and you know the first record we put into it to listen to was peter paul and mary not <laughs> really <laughs> and then it was simon and garfunkel i mean we're talking 1969 1970 yep. that was pop music that, that was. was current bridge you know? over troubled waters yeah all oh, that man you know and, this uh, is Robinson. So it was that kind of stuff, you know, just, um, it was about solving a problem mm -hmm. even then. Mm -hmm. It was about, I took every toy I had apart, <laughs> but yeah. I, I was that weird kid that could actually put it back together and have it work. That's cool. And I especially took them apart if they didn't work and I'd put them back together and make them work. Mm -hmm. So, you know. So as a kid, you were like that. What was, well, let me ask you this. What, what was the car you took for your driver's license? Oh, oh. well, okay. That was a, a 1971 Datsun 510. Oh, really? Four door. Yep. This is, uh, that's, that's not far off of like that 70s show. Oh man. I mean, that was a Toyota in that, yeah. in that, that move, that TV show, but yeah, kind of the I, same thing. And I had a. A very interesting experience with my driver's license. Well, <laughs> driver training in school was tough on me um, because I had driven. I think the first time I drove a vehicle was with my dad. He had built a Jeep out of an Austin A40. <laughs> and it was a wooden body Jeep and it was actually really cool. Um, it ended up selling to some guy in Manitoba who used it on his ranch for eons. Very reliable piece. He built it, my dad built it on the garage pad before we had a garage. Okay. Uh, he pieced it all together and then he took it all apart and took it in the basement, piece <laughs> by piece. Okay. And he built it in the basement and painted it and everything. And then he took it completely apart again and took it upstairs in spring onto the garage pad and reassembled it. Wow. Oh yeah. Um, and it was really cool. That was... Uh, before 1969, because when he went to Calgary, because he, he got a job there, he was in construction, he, uh, he drove that, used it for the commute back and forth to <laughs> Calgary from Saskatoon <laughs> oh. in the dead of winter. Wow. Uh, and it was a home-built, wooden-bodied car. And, uh, yeah. So, anyways, <laughs> off of the driver's license thing. So, uh, I had this... Uh, this little Datsun 510 and I drove that Jeep when I was seven but anyways uh out at the farm and stuff at my my you know uncles and relatives and stuff you know I was forever monkeying around with equipment mm -hmm. uh, whether it was the tractor or whether it was the the grain truck or whether it was you know whatever um 
Just because I love that sort yeah. of stuff. Yeah. So when I got the opportunity to take driver training, I was bored. I was really, really bored. <laughs> um, they give you this simulator that was roughly based on, you could either go automatic or column shift three speed standard. And uh, when I'd get bored, I would just plant my foot on the floor and, <laughs> and just watch the road come at me at like 20 mile an hour on the screen in front of us. And, you know, he's looking for signals and brake applications. And uh, I was kind of a <laughs> jackass. Didn't, didn't do what I was supposed to do. So he left it as long as he could before actually taking me out on the road. And we'd written our test and I got my learner's license. When I finally got the opportunity to drive, he put two other kids in the back seat. <laughs> a, it was an Aspen, a Dodge Aspen. Dodge Aspen, yeah. Yep, uh, with a brake pedal on the right-hand side. Uh -huh. um, and uh, he said, Kate, let's go for a drive. And we pulled out onto 22nd Street and drove all the way down to Idlewild and turned right. And as we're approaching the lights at Idlewild and 20th, he said, uh, turn right so i had to quickly turn right onto 21st uh -huh. because the light was green at 20th so then go around the block and around the block and around the block until finally we were about to get a red light it was turning yellow at 20th and idlewild to head out on the freeway so he says just go straight and stop at the light so i stopped at the light and i sat there the light turned green and I took my foot off the brake and started to apply the gas. And, but he had his, fir, his foot firmly on the brake and wouldn't <laughs> let me drive. And I said to him, uh, I believe the light is green. <laughs> and he said, what are you doing wrong? And I said, well, I don't know that this is the time for that sort of education. There are vehicles behind us and we're obstructing traffic. And he says, no, nope, we're not going anywhere until you tell me what you're doing wrong. And I said, well, specifically at this moment, uh, supposedly driving with you, that's a problem. <laughs> so I got out of the car and left him sitting there at the light with his foot on the brake in the passenger side. And I walked back to the school. <laughs> so I wasn't allowed to drive for a few weeks, as you can well imagine. So the next time... He finally had to let me drive again. We went for a drive. Same thing, round the block, round the block, round the block. Oh look, the light's gonna turn red as we pull up. So 20th and Idlewild, pull up and stop. The light turned green, he wouldn't take his foot off the brake. And I said, are you still on this? And he says, well, you haven't told me what you did wrong. And I said, I know what I did wrong last time. And he says, oh yeah, what? And I said, I got out of the car. It's your turn. And I was about six foot two, about <laughs> 245, 250. <laughs> and he saw the sense in it because he knew I was angry. And he got out. <laughs> really? It was pouring rain. And uh, I drove up the freeway and up <laughs> Lor or Ruth Street and made a U-turn or not a U-turn, but around the block. And came back and we passed him on 22nd street he looked somewhat like a drowned rat <laughs> and i drove by honking the horn and waving and when i got back to the school and parked the car I, I wasn't allowed to drive anymore but i did have my learner's license because that was a written test you were allowed to drive it's just that i didn't really do so well in the driver training thing <laughs> so as luck would have it when it came to be my turn to go and get my driver's license i wasn't in a rush all my buddies had their licenses. I was younger than all of them. Okay. Um, but I was the only one that had a car. So they would all hoof it or bike over to my place, and then they would I, either I would drive because they had their license, or they would drive my car. Um, so I didn't worry about it till I was almost 17. And then I thought, well, maybe I should go for my license. It would be really convenient because then I could get a job, get there and home and whatever, <laughs> right? <laughs> So uh, I went to do my driving test, and imagine my surprise. <laughs> the tester comes out, and he had transferred from driver training into testing. Oh, God. So 
I get this guy, he's not in a good mood because he recognized me, obviously, and he was still hurting from walking in the rain. And uh, he was sore about that. <laughs> so <laughs> we went for the driving test, and, and my little Datsun 510, although everything worked on it, uh, it was quite a piece of crap. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, it was a standard, and he said to me, when we got back, he didn't say anything ahead of time, but when we got back, he gave me uh, 81 points off. 81. 81, yeah. Yeah, he said it was nine points off, which is a fail, every time I downshifted without my foot on the brake to let people behind you know that you're slowing up. And I said, correction. I said, actually, I had my foot on the brake every time, you can't see my feet when I'm driving. How would you know that I didn't have my foot on the brake? And he says, well, I know you didn't. And I, he was wrong. But because that was the only thing that I did wrong, apparently, I was allowed to drive again in two weeks. Mm -hmm. So I made another appointment. Lucky me, same guy. So I told him this time, put on your glasses. <laughs> And uh, <laughs> he insists that there were four times that I did downshift without applying the brake pedal to light up my brake lights. So he gave me 36 points off the second time <laughs> and said, now you're getting there. Jeez. So two weeks later, I went in for my third test. And they said, uh, well, your, your tester will be out right away. And when he walked out, I made a horrendous noise. I was rather indignant. And uh, I asked to speak to the boss, and I said, this guy has a person, a personal issue with me. I don't think that it's fair. I think that I'm getting ripped off. I'm not a terrible driver. You can actually look at my test scores and see that the only thing that I've given, been given any demerit points for is one thing. And if I haven't learned that, then yes, I'm stupid. But <laughs> I'm telling you, I don't do that. So they said, okay. He says, well, then why don't we try another tester this time and we'll see how you really are at driving. They brought out this woman. Oh my goodness. She looked like she hated the world. <laughs> I was thinking, oh boy, what have I done now? She came out to the car and she looked it over with a fine tooth comb. She was not amused. My rusty junkie Datsun. And uh, when she was content that everything was functional on the car and that it was actually road legal, <laughs> uh, we went on the driving test. Um, she didn't say much other than turn left at the next intersection, you know, uh, turn right at the next intersection. Yeah. We get back and she, she says, well, she says, that was rather remarkable. She says, I've been doing driver testing for quite a number of years and you are the first person that I will ever give a driver's license to zero points off in a manual transmission car. <laughs> and I said, excellent. And she says, so what was that argument about earlier when they sent me out? I heard some yelling and I said, well, the tester that was supposed to take me out and uh, he was, I was a student of his in driver training before he transferred. And I kind of made him walk back to the school in the rain one day. And she says, you're that guy? I said, yeah, I'm that guy. <laughs> and she laughed. And then she went in and talked to the boss. And they refunded me for my first two tests. <laughs> so awesome. even though it took three tries to get my driver's license, it sort of only took one. So, Wow. Uh, what was the car that your friends came to drive? That was the Datsun. That was the Datsun. Oh, yeah. I had three of them in a row. It was like Datsun 510 hell. <laughs> Datsun 510 hell. Yeah. Then I had a two-door Datsun 510 with a 289 Hypo and a four-speed Chevy Saginaw four-speed, actually. Huh. Uh, with the crudest adapted bell housing. Um, and then I had a Datsun 510 two-door that somebody else had built, and I got it. It was horribly rusty. But uh, <laughs> it had a, a, a 1800 out of a newer 710 or something with a, a small chamber like a 1969 1600 head on it and and headers and uh, side draft su carbs and hmm. and uh 
and a five speed out of a 240 or something and a it was a blast but it was so rotten it was dangerous <laughs> so uh yeah and then i bought a north american car a 1968 fairlane fastback cool yeah and uh i loved that car it was actually pretty cool but it was it was a lot of money back then 800 bucks i paid for that thing and uh, it had new paint on it it had been painted in the guy's garage but it it, it looked pretty good you know and uh it was a really blustery windy day years later not years later maybe maybe a year later and i was sitting in my bedroom and the car was parked on the driveway just outside the window and and the wind was moving my car oh. because it was really blustery and Fairlane Fastbacks are kind of an arrow shaped car and all I could hear was this horrendous donkey sounding creaking hee-hawing noise <laughs> coming from the front suspension of those things because you weren't there was no provision from factory for lubricating the front upper pivots oh really yeah for the spring seats and so it was sitting there creaking and moaning away in the wind, and I decided it had to go. <laughs> so I sold the car to Steve Betker, of all people. <laughs> yeah, and his brother drove it for quite some time. It, uh, yeah. And then from there, it was... Uh, my buddies asked me, what do you want next? And I said, well, um, I'd like a 67 or 68 Cougar. A 68 or 69 Charger, or a 66 or 67 Chevelle. Yep. And, uh, which is obvious, I'm not any particular mark or make. Um, I, I just dig them all. I'm a gearhead. Yep. And I ended up with a 67 Malibu <laughs> that was a one-owner car, and it was, it was in such nice condition. Yeah. And uh, total granny car. In fact, I got pulled over by the cops in uh, Lloyd Minster. Um, I was on my way to Alberta to visit some family and, and I got pulled over by the cops because they suspected I'd stolen the car <laughs> because I was a young punk driving grandma's car and they were pretty grandma's sure Malibu. that I'd stolen this car, you know, white walls and hubcaps and you know. vinyl top. No, oh, no, 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 no. But I do know where that car is to this day. Really? The guy I sold it to, handed it down to his son and, and then to his younger son. So, uh, and he still has it to this day. And really? It, it's sitting in the backyard. It's, um, it's actually really nice condition to this day. Really? Yeah. That's um, cool. Yeah. And I, uh, yeah, that, that, that car. So, and that led to just a string of Chevelles and Beaumonts and, and you name it all. Just how, how many do you think you've owned in total? 289. Oh, you know, exactly. Oh Yeah. 289 yeah that include includes the bgvs oh that in no that doesn't include the bgvs it does include some parts cars that didn't necessarily start out as parts cars cars that i thought i might do something with but then decided no probably best just to what use are... what i can off of this and so i've never in my life ever bought a car ever just to flip and make money you intended to keep, like, to have them. Every car that I bought was a car that I wanted, was a car that I cared about, <laughs> a car awesome. that I intended to either restore, repair, uh, drive, uh, improve in some way. Yeah. Um, but the problem was that um, I ended up doing the improvements that I that I planned for them and then people would, you should sell me that car. <laughs> and so I would sell it. Yep. Um, I had very little respect for the, the whole idea of buying and flipping and making a buck because to me, these old cars, they, they kind of have a soul, you know? Yeah, yeah. They, they have so many stories. They have so much history. They, mm -hmm. like, you can't ever know all that they've been through mm -hmm. and and that means something to me yeah to me to to buy something and go yeah i can make a buck on this is completely impersonal there's no strength to that as i see it mm -hmm. i mean if you do that for a living fine 
I guess. I just could never do it. Yeah. I could never do it. I would sooner pass a car on to somebody who would care about it for less money. Yeah. Than to sell it to someone who's just going to flip it and pad their pocket. Yeah. Yeah. You know? So, yeah, 289. 289. Yeah. Holy cow. When I met Rochelle, I had 14 cars and nine motorcycles. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the wonderful thing, among all of the wonderful things about her, <laughs> yeah. she never had any idea that that should change. That's pretty cool. And, uh, well, neither did I, but it kind of happened. And I think I've only got, I'd have to think about it. I think it might be six or seven vehicles now, cars, and only three motorcycles. Well, so, that's it. Yeah. Six or seven, do they all run? Not currently. No. 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 Um, one, two, three, four. I think four, five, five run. Five run? Yeah. That's pretty good. Yeah. That's pretty good. Yeah. Okay. There's a couple stories I know of that I, I got to ask you about. <laughs> We're going to start with this one. Uh oh. Um, I heard about a pretty unique blazer with a Corvette engine in it. Yeah. Yeah, that was my dad's. Um, dad worked at SMP, as I'd mentioned earlier. Right. And, uh, and he kind of liked the, the, the blazers. I mean, square body, GM, they have a large following oh, now. Oh, huge now, yeah. And, uh, and he had heard, because he worked there, this was in uh, 1974, the fall of 74, and he had heard that in 1976 they were planning on doing away with the complete removable roof and leaving a roof section over the driver's compartment. And uh, that didn't sit well with him because he really liked the idea of the whole roof coming off. Mm -hmm. It went back to the wooden Jeep that he built. D yeah. The whole roof came off, right? <laughs> um, so he thought that was proper. So he special ordered a 1975 K5 Blazer uh, in the fall of 1974. And he went and picked it up in Oshawa. Wow. Brand new 1975 K5 Blazer. It was burnt orange with the white inset stripe, the uh, accessory GM white spoke mags with the, the burnt orange color coated oh, pinstripe cool. on the rims, the, the original 4x4 four four hubcaps. Uh, it had the, the automatic or the, the um, full time four wheel drive system where you didn't have to lock the hubs. Mm, you could mm -hmm. shift it into four wheel drive and. Um, but uh, it had the orange and tan houndstooth check interior. That's cool. Buckets with the center console. Um, it was actually, it was very cool. But the coolest thing was that uh, it came with an L82 <sighs> Corvette engine that if you know the right people when you're ordering a vehicle, you can get what you want. And if you work at a dealership, you probably know the right people. Um, so I remember that thing having the Corvette fin valve covers with the crossed flags and the, the chrome distributor cover and everything really? right out of the same era Corvette. Um, yeah. And it was, uh, that's the way it was built, special ordered. Um, I don't know if you're supposed to do that, but he did. And, uh, well, somebody at the factory let him. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I I I have a suspicion now that that trick doesn't go so far anymore it, it because it doesn't. There's, it's very difficult to build something like that that's so, so off the beaten path because, you know, you consider they would have had to bring a crate engine, uh, a drop in from, Bowling Green, mm -hmm. and to Oshawa, Ontario, to put in on the line. Can you imagine being one of the guys working on the line that day? And your job is every day to drop these boring, smoggy 305s and 350s. Well, at the time, it would have been 350s into these trucks. And, and it'd be like ho-hum, right? Yep. And all of a sudden, there's this, <gasps> whoa. Gleek. And maybe two or three years later, he'd be, remember that day we got that Blazer came through and we put that Corvette engine in there? You know? I mean... 
maybe it seems overly romantic, but, <laughs> but the idea is that that would have made this guy's day after spending every every day turning the same bolt on the same assembly on the same line and all of a sudden he got this refreshing little taste like a rainbow you know i, I gotta admit that it must have been more interesting though to be on a, a line then than it is now i would imagine because you know most cars now you can't even pick the interior color never no, mind anything no. else right there's three different packages and that's that's it that's all that's the only way the vehicle comes three different ways pick the yeah. outside color that's yeah it, right i mean then though like you said the Corvette engine, but yeah. I mean that Blazer could have been ordered with a bench or buckets, different color interiors. Oh yeah, you know yeah. all kinds of different power options and yeah, and then that's just a, a Blazer. You move into the, like a car, and there was oh. even more crazy things that they could have done. You know? Oh yeah, in fact, and 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 had been done. I mean, I remember seeing uh, and in, in Saskatchewan here a, a Nova. It'd be about a '74, I think, four door sedan red low original miles really really nice condition mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. i think somebody from somewhere out uh, out of town somewhere a small community owns it um red with a green interior <laughs> and i thought Mary. you know that's cooler than it is odd it's I, I think that was a Merry Christmas, honey. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, can you imagine being the guy on the line that day going, wow. What the? I've, I've also heard rumors, though, that when they got to the end of a production, or maybe it was the beginning, but when they were getting the line going or they were at the end of a run and, and you know, it just kind of became, there was lots of ordered cars done by the, the lot manager or the sales manager at the dealerships. Ordered on spec, or knowing on they'd s- sell the car. Right. But then there was also cars that the, the plant just built just because they'd push out and make dealers sell. They would just arrive. There, There is a one, one little problem with that um, idea, though. Um, I mean, you know, going back as far as Henry Ford... Mm-hmm. Um, give the people what they want as it were when really he just wanted to put money in his pocket yeah yeah that's all fine and uh very powerful man but it didn't do an auto manufacturer any favors to build really odd cars yeah um because people would see for instance a red nova with a green interior the vast majority of people would see that on the lot and go why would Chevrolet do that? Yeah, yeah. You know, so, um, I mean, as an example, the the car that I've got in the garage, um, it wasn't one of the recognized kind of normal color combinations. Mm-hmm. And uh, so the communication from General Motors to the dealer was, are you sure you should have this guy re-choose an interior color that's in the recommended color palette combination? Uh, because if it shows up and he doesn't like the car, how are you going to sell it? Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. So I don't think that they built those outlandish cars uh, just on spec because we've got, oh, we got all these red interiors sitting here and we've got all of these, these uh, you know, whatever green bodies or vice versa, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I don't think that it was really ever done that way because I think it would have been uh, um, suicide. <laughs> You know, yeah, <laughs> flood the lots with cars that nobody wants. That that's, nobody wants. Yeah, that, yeah, that would have been poor form. That's true. That's very true. Yeah. So I don't know. I mean, I can't speak from experience, but it makes sense to me now that 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 wouldn't have been a good business move. They did let people order some weird crap, though. They yes, right. But you would have to put a considerable de- de- like uh, down payment or deposit on a car that you were specially or special ordering, because. You know, if you if it showed up and you were completely off your rocker and it just looked dumb, uh, you were you you bought it. Yeah, right. That's right. So, okay, let, yeah. let me ask you this one. Wh- wh- I can't figure out in my head why somebody would order the my Buick the way they ordered it, and it doesn't quite make sense to me that you order a car. And I know this that it's an American car that it came from the U.S. at some point. Yeah. It wasn't a Canadian sold one. Okay. Uh. Why you ordered a car like like a full size Buick? 
Right. Put a power seat, air conditioning, and tilt. Um, you know, map lights and cornering lights and a power trunk release. And like, it's got some, uh, you know, some nice stuff on it for that age. But not put power windows and locks on it. Okay. So, um, there are people that uh, don't trust those things. I mean, if your cruise control quits, whatever. If your trunk release doesn't work, you can unlock it with a key. Yeah. Um, if your, uh, you know, but if your power windows won't go down. Yeah. And if your door locks fail, you're stuck. Yep. You're stuck in the car, you know. And, and there were people that were that paranoid. There were people that were that worried. But on the other hand, you could consider this. Now, whether that car was, I don't know if you know whether it was actually specifically ordered that way. I don't know. Or if it was a, a stock build, like a spec build that just went to a dealership. Because if that were the case, they've knocked a few hundred dollars off of the price of the car. And somebody could buy an absolutely gorgeous, gorgeous Electra 225 mm-hmm. that when you pulled up in the driveway, the neighbors knew you were a big deal. Because you had a Buick. Right. But you paid a few hundred dollars less, so it was in your price range now. Yeah, okay. Because they knocked a couple of options off that people couldn't tell by looking at it. It still had the skirts, it still had the cornering lamps, it still had the, the bells and whistles, the look, the, you know, yep. of, of opulent luxury. But without actually peering through the window, they couldn't tell that it didn't have the power windows and power locks. Sure, it had the seats. That's that's a comfort thing when you're driving. Uh, it had the the air conditioning, and that's well, kind and, of a must. And but. it couldn't it could have come from the southern states. I have no idea where it came from, yeah. right? Yeah. And that uh, years and years ago. So it very well could have could have needed air conditioning, because yeah. you know when you're in Texas or you know California, and that's well, where it existed. Yeah. You know. You know, and that's the thing. I mean. But I, I, I would probably, if it were a special ordered car, I'd probably chalk it up to paranoia because there are lots of strange <laughs> people out there and lots of people that can't fix that sort of electrical stuff. Yeah. They wouldn't know what to do in the event that it quit. So Yeah, that's I right. Mean, me, with the fist on the door panel, if the motor quits working, you know, that's the first thing. Are the brushes stuck or is it electrical? Yeah. You know? So. <laughs> okay, back to the Blazer. The cool thing about the Blazer is that your dad bought this cool car, this it, truck. He ordered it. And, and it's it's resurfaced. Yeah. Um, Rochelle and I were at a grocery store. We were driving the Chrysler. And this, um, well, uh, how can I put it tenderly? <laughs> the guy didn't scare me. <laughs> but I certainly did wonder what was going on. Because there was this fellow riding circles around my car on his bicycle. And uh, so I had to go in and get some groceries. So I got out of the car and and I said, excuse me. And he says, man, I love your car. Oh, he says, this is like the coolest car I've ever seen. He says, I, I'm, I'm actually into square body GM trucks. But, you know, I mean, this, this, is, this is a really cool car of my 62 Chrysler. And I said, well, thank you. And he says, yeah, you know, I, I detail cars for a living. I, I polish paint and I, I uh, you know, vacuum and shampoo interiors and what have you. And I, I do it mobile. And I'm thinking, hmm, well, that's kind of neat, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, presumably on his bicycle. Well, I guess. And then he told me, yeah, you know, he says, I got a customer out, in, uh, out near Dundurn. And I'm just polishing a truck for him. Uh, or it was last week, and, and he's got this super cool blazer out there. I've never seen anything like it, and he's in the process of kind of redoing it, and and it's got a factory Corvette engine in it. And I said, oh, what color is it? And he goes, well, it's like that, that burnt orange color with white, and it's the one with the whole roof that comes off, like the 75, you know? <laughs> and uh, and I said, well, that's really interesting, and, and the guy cares about it. He loves the thing. Oh, Yeah. Yeah, he says, uh, and it's his next project. He's he's going to finish it up. So this is just some guy talking. Yeah. Um, I've never made contact with the guy because I don't know where to begin. Um, I guess if I had lots of money, I'd 
buy the thing and gift it to my dad. <laughs> but uh, very unique and interesting that it kind of stuck around, that it's it's sitting in some guy's shop somewhere out east of town or south of town. And I, I, I thought, how remarkable is that? <laughs> That's pretty you know? cool. My dad sold that thing in 1977. Two years later. Yeah, he sold it to buy a Chevy Beauville van, full-size, long wheelbase van to pull our travel trailer. You know what, Calvin? We're going to have to pause right there, and we will save the rest for the next episode. Thank you for listening to Bald Tires. Make sure you join us next episode. Calvin will keep you laughing in stitches as we go over some of the vehicles he's owned, a lot of them, and he's got some great, fantastic stories along the way. I'm Jake Thomas. You've been listening to Bald Tires, because when you make great memories, you make bald tires.